Hi everyone, I'm Mike Novogratz and this is Next with Nova. So listen, I started this podcast called Next with Nova with a really simple idea. I was like, I've got such a privileged life that I meet all these cool people from all walks of life. And that I would t- kind of bring them onto the, the, the show, just have an easy discussion with them and kind of share my insights or their insights with uh, my audience, which is small, but growing. <laughs> uh, and after we had you out here in Jackson Hole, um, I thought Jimmy's one of the coolest dudes I've met. And so I really appreciate you coming on. And uh, let me just start with like a little of your life story because a lot of people don't know it. Uh, you know, you grew yeah. up, how'd you become a climber? <laughs> I mean, so I grew up in Mankato, Minnesota population. I think it was 30,000 people. Um, pretty much, I think one of the most unlikely places in the country that to produce a high altitude alpine big wall climber and high altitude ski mountain here. <laughs> Uh, you know, the town is surrounded by car- corn fields. My first job was corn detasseling. I don't know if, pe- if people know what that is, but it's not a very glamorous job. You know, I had a paper route. Um, my parents were uh, Chinese immigrants. They had moved to Minnesota because they heard it was a really nice place to raise a family. They were both librarians at the small university there. And so I grew up in, in kind of middle America, small town, USA. And um, my parents were pretty <laughs> stereotypical immigrant Chinese parents. Uh, they wanted me to have more opportunities than they had. Um, so there was a lot of focus on well, academics, um, they wanted, you know, I started playing the violin when I was three. I swam competitively from when I was seven. I started martial arts it's like for as long as I could remember. It's like one of my first memories with my dad. And I competed in martial arts as well. So my childhood upbringing was really very intense with very high expectations of where I was going to go. T- tiger mom and tiger dad. <laughs> very much. And uh, my dad was very strict. Um, and that's just the world I knew. But I, I lived with a foot in one foot in this Chinese, you know, household where I was brought up bilingual. If I didn't speak Chinese to them, they would ignore me. So I, I literally only, I only spoke to them in Chinese. And then I had another foot in this other world, you know? One was like, I think the biggest distinction was always, I loved going to my friend's house and having macaroni and cheese and hamburgers. <laughs> and my friends loved coming to my house to eat pot stickers, Kung Pao chicken, you know? <laughs> But I was raised with this idea that there was really only like three or four careers, right? It was like, you could be a professor, you could be a doctor, you could be a lawyer, um, you know, or go into finance. And, and that was kind of my worldview. Um, and, I was, and I was very competitive because that that's what I did. I competed every weekend. Sometimes on the weekends, I would go to a swim meet and a martial arts competition. Um, but I found skiing, there was this teeny little ski hill behind my house and skiing was my thing. And I got to ski if I did really well and everything else. And that was my first connection to the outdoors. Um, but the other big influence in my life was that my parents were librarians. I had a sister that was six years older than me. She was a voracious reader because my parents brought books home every day, all the time. and. I was reading fairly far ahead of my kind of age group because I was reading what my sister was passing down to me and I was just reading a ton. And I just think that opened my imagination to this whole like bigger world. Um, And I just couldn't wait. There's like this sense of urgency that 
I was stuck in this little town and all I wanted to do was go out to this bigger world and explore the world. It's a cool world to explore. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, so I guess I should tell you how I found climbing. Yeah. So I find climbing uh, late in high school. I go to college. I'm studying international relations and um, comparative religion, but all I want to do is go climbing. Um, so when I finally finish college, I tell my parents, look, I'm going to, I just need to take a year off before I go to grad school. Cause I was, you know, applying for grad schools at the time I was thinking about going to Georgetown, um, somewhere East coast. And I, but instead I moved to Yosemite and I started climbing full time. And what was one year turned into two, turned into three. And, and pretty much I lived out of a car from like 21 to 28. I, I lived on the road. Yeah, give, people some, give people some sense of what it is to be like a young climate junkie. Like, <laughs> well, Yosemite is kind of like the heart of traditional climbing in the U.S. And it's kind of the epicenter of real serious climbing. It's like, if you want to be a pro surfer, you got to move to the North shore of Oahu and pay your dues at pipeline in the climbing world. You go to Yosemite and you start hucking laps on El Cap and, you know, climbing back in the nineties was much less mainstream. Most of the people I met there were kind of fringe characters. They were really from all walks of life, but we were all living on the fringe of society. And at the time, there is a certain kind of pride you took into being a dirtbag climber because the more dirtbag you were showed that you were how committed you were to this craft of climbing and this lifestyle of climbing. So, I mean, I lived in a cave behind the Yosemite <laughs> Search and Rescue in Camp 4. I lived, you know, it was, it was Jack Kerouac, you know, like living on the road, the freedom of the West, like it, it was wild times. And, um, and that I, I, I found my community because there was this dirt bag, like I'm a core climber thing, but it, you shouldn't let that fool you because some of these were some of the most driven, ambitious characters I'd ever met, you know, you know, to push the sport, to push themselves, there was an extraordinary risk, you know, how hard you would push, um, how strong you were, what kind of endurance you had, how, how kind of, you know, how good you were at this craft. And the craft of climbing isn't just a physical endeavor, you know, it's like, there's so much mental fortitude, there's so much calculation and assessment and, um, creativity involved in the climbing and you know I didn't know but at the time my peer group many of those climbers turned out to be the best climbers of our generation and that was my my peer group um and what so I started the, how was how old were you when you first climbed El Cap uh I think I was I was 21 and you know, at the time, climbing on Capitan when I first showed up there was like, I thought that was the ultimate goal of climbing. Like if I could climb El Cap, I'd be a real climber. And after a few seasons, I was doing, I was hucking laps on El Cap in a day, you know, like doing, you know, multiple ascents of El Cap even in a week. Wow. And I realized at that point that actually this was just the training ground for even something bigger, which was the Alpine big walls in like the greater ranges, like in the Karakoram. And these were walls that were bigger than El Cap and they were at 18, 19, 20,000 feet. And it was a whole new realm. And in order to get to that world of climbing, you had to be so proficient on El Cap that you could even dare think about going into the big, big mountains. And I set my sights on 
those mountains because then I realized when I was in Yosemite, I was like, oh, that's where real climbers go. It's not even here in Yosemite. <laughs> it's this next level. Um, and that's, that's really where I spent the next 15, 20 years of my life. Um, and I also moved into ski mountaineering. Um, I moved to Jackson. I spent a lot of time in Jackson, Wyoming. Where... I'm, I'm, I'm interviewing you here from Jackson Hole. <laughs> oh, you're at the Caldera. I am at Caldera House. Well, I am I mean, you know, I mean, you, Jackson Hole for ski mountaineering is like Yosemite is for rock climbing. So I started skiing a lot of the peaks in the Tetons. And again, it was like, wow, if I could ski the Grand Teton, then I'm a real ski mountaineer. And then after skiing it 10, 15 times, I was like, oh, this is just training to go ski the big 8,000 meter peaks in the world. And so over the next 15, 20 years, I really threw myself at these big alpine, big walls in the Himalayas and these big ski mountaineering objectives in the Himalayas. So, so I was in Taos, New Mexico to ski two weeks ago and they had a great three foot of powder and we were all excited and we got out there and it was, you know, I'm not used to skiing powder up to my waist. And after about four turns, I couldn't breathe. And then I would, my legs started hurting and I would fall and I was stuck in the snow and it was so hard to get up. I'd finally get up and I was, <laughs> and by the time I went down, there was a lot of trees. It was not glade skiing. It was like literally trees everywhere. And if I didn't have my guide with me, I think I would have been still on the mountain. He had to dig me out like four times. It was like maybe the most miserable athletic performance of my life. And I just realized it was the altitude. I just couldn't function. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I, I put a funny tweet. I was like, I guess I wasn't meant to be a mountain climber because Taos had its 10,000 feet or whatever, 9,000 yeah. at the base and 12, that kicked my ass. And so is it just acclimatizing or were you, were you always easy in the, the high altitude? I mean, I think there's certainly a huge element of being able to perform at altitude that has to do with acclimatization. Absolutely. Like you can be the most fit athlete in the world, be unacclimatized, and still get your ass kicked. Um, but it certainly helps if you are a really strong athlete, you have a high VO2 max, you do, um, you, you know, you're aerobically fit. Um, but a lot of it also comes from experience. I think undoubtedly training as a swimmer for a really long time and learning how to pace and understanding how to like manage your heart rate and when you could ride that edge between being aerobic and anaerobic was a huge help in my mountaineering because you just know how to pace so that you know if you're going you know some days you go out there you're doing 12 16 hour days, maybe even longer on bigger objective on the big pushes. So you got to know at the beginning of the day, okay, I need to set an all day pace. And there are certain moments when you might have to elevate that and push through something. Um, but it's that experience from multiple, well, a lot of days in the mountains, a lot of expeditions where you learn how to pace, when to dig deep, how much reserve you can keep. Even when you think you've burned your reserve, you know how much you can push. There's a lot of calculation that you're, you're kind of constantly making. Interesting. Yeah. When did you start taking pictures? You pulled the camera. So I started, yeah, I, I started taking photos when I was in Yosemite. Um, and I had no aspirations to be a photographer and certainly no, never imagined being a filmmaker. Those were just like outside of my realm of even imagination. Um, I was either supposed to be, you know, lawyer, doctor, professor, or then I was just focused on being a climbing, climbing bomb or a climber. 
but I did pick up a camera in my early 20s um, and started shooting basically my friends while we were on these kind of wild climbs just to kind of document for myself and for posterity. And like I said before, it just turns out that, you know, a lot of my friends became professional climbers and pretty soon the magazines and the sponsors needed photos of my friends. And I was getting the calls to go shoot them also because my, my friends knew that I could climb with them and shoot. And I wasn't a liability. I wasn't, they weren't bringing on some random photographer that they didn't trust to climb with. And most of the places that they were climbing pretty inaccessible unless you were a real climber. Um, and the real breakthrough moment was during my first expedition to the Karakoram, it was 1999. And I had bought a camera right before that trip. And, uh, and I photographed that trip and pretty much, ton, you know, I published a ton of photos from that trip and immediately started getting commercial work from companies like the North Face and Patagonia and Mountain Hardware and such. Um, and, and it was also, and then in 2001, I signed um, up my first sponsorship deal with the North Face which, you know, it's, it's 2022 now. This is my 21st year yeah. on the North Face team. So how much did Instagram, because I, I met you, I met, I put quotations. I, I discovered you through your Instagram account. Someone said it to me, right. I was like, dude. And then it was that and the National Geographic Instagram account. And, you know, yeah. you were popping up in my feed all the time. How much did that change your life? Did you become kind of, mini celebrity or was it not till the movies well it's interesting because there are people who know me from after instagram and then there are people who kn knew me before instagram because i had been shooting for national geographic and outside magazine men's journal and and all these different magazines um pre-instagram and so there was kind of a, you know, there was a bit of a following or, or people who knew, because a lot of the trips that I shot, I was often also part of the story. Right. And so um, it was old school, you know, how you got to know people back in the day before Instagram and social media. Um, so it's always funny because I'll meet people and sometimes they'll be like, I that they'll claim it. They'll say, you know, I knew you before Instagram. You know, I remember <laughs> and, and I'll be like, oh, that's OG. You know, like, they, they, yeah. you know, I, 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 I appreciate that, you know. Um, but I would say that my lifestyle, what well, didn't really change. Like I was always focused on the work. Um, you know, I, I, I did find it interesting that this whole social media thing, you know, certainly propelled my, my name to, to more people, but. But if you think it's about it, been about the work, you, you know, know, when you think about your movies, uh, your movies, your documentaries, plus your, your, your National Geographic work, plus Instagram, you are a large part of why climbing is so mainstream. I mean, I, now I, on my TikTok and my Instagram, I get people climbing in the gym photos. I mean, you know, you see climbing everywhere all of a sudden. Uh, I'm guessing the amount of people trying it has gone up, you know, limit. Um, and it's, you know, partly because of you or you're in the right time at the right place with the right camera. <laughs> um, and so that's got to feel kind of cool. I mean, I, I, I think... There was a confluence and it's a chicken or the egg thing. It's either, I mean, I do know that after Free Solo came out, I talked to a lot of gym owners. I know a lot of the owners of kind of the bigger conglomerate, gym conglomerates. And they say that the participation in gym climbing certainly 
they said there was a pre-free solo and a post-free solo in terms of um, membership. So maybe it, it might have had an influence, but I think it was more that there was a confluence of the proliferation of gym climbing, where it made climbing much more accessible, especially to people in urban environments. I think that there had been a long growth in the interest of climbing from climbing films from my friends like Sender Films and Pete Mortimer and, and Nick Rosen. Those guys have been making climbing films for a long time. Um, there was a lot more money coming into the outdoor industry. Uh, there were a lot more brands like the North Face and Black Diamond and Mountain Hardware and Patagonia and Arcteryx. There's like money coming into the industry too. So it's almost like there was a moment in an intersection where like when Free Solo came out, it was probably just at the right moment. Um, and those things all coming together, this confluence, it was a moment, I think. So let me go back a second. So I think when I last talked to you, you told me you were on 35 or 33 expeditions in your life. Uh, mm -hmm. So explain what an expedition is. Like, is it three weeks? Is it? Yeah. Uh, so we, we kind of, in my mind, we, we kind of divide expeditions into soft core and hardcore. And I don't want to make the reference necessarily to porn, but that's just, <laughs> it's like, there are trips that are kind of put together more for the shooting. And that's a great, easy story, um, good characters. And then there's the, these trips with, that are truly cutting edge where you're trying to push like to the absolute- Like Meru. Edge, yeah. Um, so it kind of depends. And it also depends on where you're going. So I'll just frame it this way. If you're a professional climber, especially a professional like adventure, exploratory climber, you're really trying to go out and do first ascents, climbs that nobody have, has ever done before, often in the most remote places where maybe there's never even, nobody's ever even visited. Um, that is how you make your mark, um, is, is your resume is about how many first ascents you've done and where in a lot of ways. Um, not that you do it for the resume, it, it is because you truly are interested in, in doing something new that pushes you creatively and physically and mentally and intellectually. Um, and it's the same with ski mountaineering. You're trying to do big first descents, like ski descents that nobody's ever done. So you're really scouring the earth, looking for these first ascents or first descents. Um, if you're going to ski a big mountain in the Himalayas, um, like if you're gonna go try to ski something like Mount Everest, you know, you have to have the sponsorship put together. You have to have the idea. You gotta put together the team. You gotta raise the money. Um, you gotta train, uh, put together the logistics. That can take a year of planning. Um, and then you go on the trip and this trip can be probably forever. So it's like eight to 10 weeks, you know, you need right. a month to acclimatize, to look at the route, to evaluate snow conditions. Um, and then maybe in the last month, you're really trying to find the weather window to, to, to do the climb and to, to ski back down. Um, but I've done trips all over, you know, to Antarctica or to Chad, Africa, like for Chad or Mali, like we were looking for first ascents of giant sandstone towers in the Sahara, you know, or in the Aneti Desert. And, you know, those trips were probably like four weeks long, but they take months and months of kind of preparation. If you drew a circle around like each trip who went with you, is there a common element like have you kind of marched through life with 10 different friends that have done two-thirds of yeah. these ascents with you 
Yeah, I mean, there's pretty much, there's a very small handful of people, you know, over 35 expeditions, there's probably really around 20 people. Wow. That I've done these trips with at the core, the core team has right. done maybe no more than 20 people, maybe even less. You know, I did, I don't even know how many expeditions I've done with Conrad. You know, uh, most of my difficult first ascents have been with Conrad. Anchor. So is there a, when, when, when you ask people like who their heroes are, are your heroes contemporary? Are they the guys that are, you know, 15 years older, like the generation above that you looked up to and said, oh my goodness, that guy. Uh, or are they guys like Alex Honnold who you're like, ooh, that guy is just so good. I mean, I have a lot of mentors. Yeah. I mean, I would say, I mean, one of the great things about my career that I, I'm most grateful for are certainly the people that I've gotten to spend time with and the mentors that I've had. And, and the mentors in my life have, I mean, I can't even say how much influence they've had over the trajectory of my career. Um, mentors are like accelerators, right? Like they just bring, they brought so much knowledge condensed and handed it over so that it's not like there's shortcuts in any career, but there's certainly people who can help point you in the right direction. Um, and, and the people that have really had a big influence in my life are, you know, certainly Conrad Anchor, um, uh, my friend Rick Ridgway, uh, guys like Yvonne Chouinard, you know, it's like John Krakauer, um, Galen Rowell, people, maybe not a lot of people know who he is, but you know, when I came up as a photographer, he was like, he was legendary adventure photographer um, that really paved the way for, for my career. Um, David Brashears, you know, really these, these mentors um, presented me with the opportunities uh, and, and allowed me to kind of, you know, shine um, with, with some of their, uh, mentorship and guidance. Um, but I, I, I certainly wouldn't be where I am now without, you know, without their help. Um, and I, I, my thought on mentors too, though, is that, you know, for the longest time, you know, a lot of people come to me and ask, well, how, how do I find the right mentor? And, from my experience, it's not like I found my mentors. It's like they found me. It's like you have to do something and you have to do something for the love of doing it and, and really push yourself to a point where someone who can be a mentor will, will recognize you and decide this person is worth mentoring, you know, and you have to pay your dues. Um, so it's not like you can just be like, oh, he's the greatest at what he does. I'm just going to go have him mentor me. It just right. doesn't really happen that way. So you became a, one of the great climbers of your generation. And now you're becoming one of the great filmmakers. And very few people, you know, have two arrows in their quiver. Uh, and so that's kind of cool. So talk a little bit about how you got into film. Um, I would say I've always parlayed one experience into another, into another, into another. So, you know, it's like taking that base of what I grew up with. I took all of that, everything I learned from swimming and martial arts and, and schooling, really critical thinking and applied it to climbing. And then I applied that, all of that to, to photography. And then from photography, you know, I took all of those things and applied it to filmmaking, which meant that I understood what it meant, what visual storytelling meant, 
um, how to tie that with the logistics of climbing, how to tie the logistics of climbing with the athleticism and training required to be an athlete. You know, so all of those kept intersecting. And as my life and career have evolved, I kind of kept parlaying what I learned from previous crafts to the next, um, whether that was team building, how do you keep a team motivated as a climber all the way into like your production team, you know, I mean, it's, it's all related, but I would say that, uh, Filmmaking as a craft is, is to me really remarkable. To me, it's, it's, it's incredible to me that any film gets made because of the complexities of making a film and all the things that need to go right and all the things that you need to anticipate. And then there's the craft of the filmmaking and everything to it. Um, but there was a period when I felt like I had pigeonholed myself I was like, I'm just a climber. And then I kind of just doubled down and said, well, I'm just gonna be the best climber I can possibly be. That's what I'm gonna to try to do. And then I became a photographer and I was like, ah, now I'm just pigeonholed as a climbing photographer. And instead of trying to spread out into a bunch of different things, I was like, well, I'm just gonna to try to be the best climbing photographer I possibly can. And that presented another opportunity. Then I became a filmmaker and then you know, I kept doubling down on this idea that I would just take whatever craft I was doing it as far as I could and commit to it. And whenever I did that, some bigger opportunity arose from that. Instead of shying away from it and being like, well, I'm going to try to do what everybody else is doing. I, I, I chose to stay with this to perfecting one craft and trying to take it as far as I could. And they just kept evolving and pushing me into these different worlds. When, when you decided to climb Meru or, or attempt to climb it, um, did you decide to climb it first to make a film or decide to climb it and then said, hey, let's make a film? <laughs> <laughs> because it's, it's, if you haven't seen the, the, the movie, people, you need to watch it. It literally is insanity, you know, of what these guys attempted and then finally you know achieved uh yeah. and, and it's insane to think about climbing it and then to think about it oh i'm also going to be filming you know with all the thought process about what's yeah. the right angle the light I, I mean meru when i headed off to meru the first time i was only focused on being a climber because that climb in some ways was the ultimate challenge and would be the culmination of a career climber's life, you know, like it, it, it was such a complex and difficult climb that required you to be not just solid, but like really good in every discipline of climbing, like rock climbing, ice climbing, mixed climbing, high altitude climbing, big wall climbing, you know, just- And you just to mentally tough. You know, and you had to be mentally tough. Um, and so I went and I did bring a camera and I filmed pieces of it. So I, I had no intention of ever making a film on the first trip. Um, on the second trip, I decided, you know, I have enough footage from that first trip that like, why not? Let's, let's, try, to, let's try to shoot it. Um, but I wasn't thinking about a feature documentary. I was more thinking about shooting some stuff for posterity. And it required everything I had ever learned as a climber, as an expedition um, participant, um, as a photographer, and as a filmmaker. It, it just, it, it literally was everything I had ever learned about my crafts kind of stacked together for me to be able to do it. And that's why I loved doing it because I was like, okay, this is like, for me, the cutting edge of what I'm humanly capable of doing. And um, it wasn't until the top of the second attempt when I shot this 
little monologue from my partner, Renan. And it was such a moving, I knew while I was shooting it and it was real. And I, I was like, this is, I, I remember pulling down the camera and I thought, well, oh, this would be an extraordinary end of a movie if I was ever gonna make a movie. Um, and it wasn't until a few months after I got back from that trip where I was like, I, I think I could, I think I could make a film about this. And it was the first time I really thought about, well, what kind of film would I want to make? And I thought, well, this, the film I would want to make would be a film to show people why we actually Actually do it because I think there's so many misperceptions around like why would anybody ever do that because they think it's about one thing but it's really about something else which is my approach to most of my films you think it's about one thing but it's you know you think Meru is about climbing a mountain but Meru is really about friendship and loyalty and commitment you know what's commitment to a dream um Free Solo is the same. You think it's about a guy trying to climb this big face on El Capitan without a rope. But it's really a character study of someone who has an outrageous dream and having the vision and putting in the time to perfect the craft, right? So, and of course, there's a love story. You know, I'm, I'm always kind of looking for the subtext of like what the story is really about. Well, for those of you who haven't seen it, Jimmy's and his wife's latest movie, and I'm going to get to your wife, because the third thing that makes you kind of incredible is that you actually work with your wife and not like half work. You, you really work. It's a real partnership with Jai making these movies. And so how did you meet her? How did you guys decide to work together? Most people would terrorize them to spend all day working with their wives. <laughs> oh, my God. I mean, it is. Every so often I think about how Crazy, <laughs> crazy, insane, and beautiful. It is because we work so intensely together, and we're parents to to our lovely kids, and 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 we're life partners. So it's it's intense. It's a lot, but I think it works because there's like a high level of mutual respect for what each person brings to the table and who, the, you know, we know each other well, but I met her um, basically at this conference where I was giving a talk and um, we were, I was trying to make Meru at the time. And I heard she was an amazing documentary filmmaker. Um, and she, she was already a very well-established filmmaker at the time. And over the course of several months, we had corresponded. And uh, eventually, he, I think we went out on a date and we started kind of dating. And then uh, I, she came in to help me with Meru, um, kind of reluctantly, but then... Um, yeah, so we were, we were dating before we started working together. And then, then we put Meru together. Um, you know, that seemed to work out pretty well. And then uh, we went on to, we, in that period of time, we, before we started Meru, we had our daughter Marina, uh, we got married. We had our son, James, at the beginning of production on Free Solo, made Free Solo. That obviously had its own life. What an, what an Academy Award! <laughs> <laughs> we did do that, and uh, and did, and did your we, did your did your mother and father finally say, "Okay, okay, you well, you, you did all right." You did neither of them right. got to see it. Neither oh, that, got to see it. But well, hopefully, from I, I think hopefully they, they looked out from heaven with a smile. Well, I remember standing on stage, and that's who I was. That's who I was feeling. 
in that moment because I was I was thinking about my, my mom and dad more than anybody. I was like, okay, uh, I hope I hope you're catching this because this is this is what you get. This is what might you not produce. be a might not be a lawyer, but I got a damn Academy Award. I know. I was like, this is what you produced, and I was I I remember I in that moment the amount of gratitude I felt to so many people and to to my parents was was profound. But um. And now, yeah, now we're we have a, a great studio that we're 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 making a lot of films right now. Um, we made the rescue. But let's talk about the rescue because I I watched the rescue I don't know a month ago and I was blown away a by the story, b by how you told the story. So for those of you who don't know, the rescue is the story of rescuing these thirteen Thai teenagers who got trapped in a cave when the water showed up and they were stuck for 16, 17, 18 days. Uh, I'll let Jimmy talk to you about it. I have to say, this is funny. On my last podcast, I had Kuti and Chica, who had just done the Kanye documentary, huh? Genius. And I'm like, oh my goodness, now I've got two docs. One of the two is going to win the Academy Award, either the rescue or genius. And I like both the filmmakers. And so I'm hedged to some degree. But I, when I saw the rescue, I thought it was a shoe in uh yeah. genius is pretty damn good uh, it's an amazing movie tell us about how you got involved in that story and why you wanted to yeah. tell it it's it's interesting because chai and i followed the 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 story as it was happening much of the world was following it at that point you know i think there was a moment in in 2018 where politically and internationally was kind of a dark moment and then there was a story about this really hopeful, beautiful story um, that everybody, well, people didn't know it was hopeful. I mean, it was riveting and then it had a positive outcome that made it even more of an extraordinary story. So we knew that that was gonna be an amazing film and we chased that film. Um, that story. I, think I, I think I cried in that movie more than I've cried in any movie in the last five years. <laughs> I'm, I'm not that big of a crier, but it just keeps bringing up that human emotion to cry as you're. Just I know. I mean, it, it is a, it is a, it is a tear jerker. I think it hits a lot of notes um, about our common humanity, and and that is actually why we felt the film was really important to make because it, it's a story about generosity. It's a story about the thing that ties all of us together, just, you know, irregardless of race, you know, nationality, cultural beliefs, spiritual beliefs, you know, that when you come together and we come together as human beings, you can achieve the impossible. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's really about a film about moral courage too. It's about these divers who basically have everything to lose to try and save these kids and they don't even blink and they make the hard decision um, because they're good human beings. And guys, and the, 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 the greatest part of this story is that the best cave divers in the world are plumbers from London and doctors from, you know, New Zealand. And they're kind of, you know, misfits. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's, it was like the bad news bears coming together to save the kids and yeah. it's the most unlikely heroes you could ever imagine. And they're complete heroes. And so you have to watch this movie. It's anyway. yes, it's on Disney Plus, um, And it's, uh, you know, we, we threw our hearts into that film. We made it during COVID um, because and, and, and for us, it was really an uplifting project to work on. Um, and it's something, you know, we're really proud of the film and, and we hope people can see it. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a great film to watch with your family um, because it, it, it does. I think it's a good reminder of, of you know, our common humanity and, and it's a good reminder of what moral, moral courage looks like. So, and it's a, bit, it's a thriller too. So. so is this now, do you age out of climbing? You know, I know I'm friends with some big giant skiers and they're like, okay, you know, at one point yeah, yeah. I've just had enough. I think, uh, I think. Is this a transition? Climbers have a little longer shelf life than skiers um, because uh, 
skiing is being a pro skier is really hard on the body and it's really hard on your knees. Um, high altitude climbing, there's kind of an evolution in a way, but you know, as with like long distance runners, um, you know, marathon runners and ultra marathon runners, I mean, they've gotten younger and younger, but you know, you have different peaks um, and in mountaineering, you know, I mean, Conrad's a classic case, you know, he, he was, he was doing, he's still climbing a lot. Um, 2020, I guess it was two years ago, we, we climbed Vincent, which is the highest peak in Antarctica. Um, we did a 24 hour push, climbed 10,000 feet and skied it. Um, all in a day. How old is he now? And I think he must have been at least 55. Wow. And I mean, yeah, this 57 year old really, had a hard time in, in Taos. Yeah, he, he was really, really strong on that trip, you know. So it depends on who you are, but you know, I think if you've got the will, you can you can you can keep doing it for a while. But the movie business is now taken off. Mm -hmm. uh, you're you're down in the Dominican Republic filming something. You've got a full slate. Uh, you're working with your wife. That's got to be exciting. It's very exciting. Uh, I think. I mean, we must. Let's see. We have at least. We have three films. One another film. Another feature documentary coming out in April. We have two more feature documentaries in production and post production. We have two new series coming out. And we're working on our first narrative feature um, with uh, Annette Benning and Jody Foster um, about uh, a Diana Nyad. And um, yeah, it's, 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 it's exciting because I'm learning a lot, you know? And, and for me, that's, that's what keeps me motivated is, is just kind of being slightly out of my comfort zone and, and trying new things. Let me, let me kind of wrap up with one kind of deeper questions. So I'm guessing, you know, with the type of adventures you've been on, A, you've lost friends uh, in your sport, in the, the big mountain uh, skiing sport, the alpining, uh, mountain, you know, you know, just climbing. Uh, you always read about these tragedies. Um, does that change how you've approached life, being closer to death? Have you kind of ever thought from the real spiritual perspective Absolutely. I, I think, at least in the worlds that I navigate, um, you know, I think that you, you ponder your mortality a lot. And, you know, I think in that sort of closeness with the idea of mortality, it really has an impact on the decisions you make in your day-to-day -day life because it's a particular lens it's it's a, a lens that maybe not everybody looks at life through but when you do certain decisions are easier to make because um you you do have that awareness of your mortality and uh, that's something that i appreciate about the community that i live in because i and, and the people that i spend a a lot of time with is that there's a certain intentionality to life because they look at life through that lens. Um, you know, every day counts, every moment counts, every relationship counts. Um, you know, there, there, there's certain people who are really pushing the edge, you know, that are friends. And every time you say goodbye, you might hug them a little bit longer. Cause you don't know, you don't know. Um, but I think people who look at life through that lens look for purpose and meaning in each day. And, and that, that brings something I think that's really special to, to life. Awesome. Well, Jim, I'm gonna let you go. I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, I think yeah. you're awesome. I'm gonna come down to the Dominican soon and at least watch you surf because 
my surf skills are about as bad as my high altitude climbing skills. <laughs> I, uh, that's okay. It's just about being stoked. It's about having fun. So I like getting out there and getting smashed around. And so, yeah, uh, well, I, I got, I got to check out your place. Would love to, see, would love to see it. Yep. Awesome. Well guys, thanks a lot. It's another episode of next with Nova with the amazing Jimmy Chin. My pleasure. It's great to see you. You too. You will. Well.